Hi, everyone. Welcome to this latest in our series of Unlocked. And I'm delighted this evening to be joined by Matt Warman, Conservative MP for Boston and Skegness since 2015. Yes. With a majority, we should mention your majority, of over 25,000, I believe. At the moment. <laughs> Uh, you've been a Minister of State, uh, you've been a Parliamentary Under Secretary for Digital, and I've been told I have to ask you questions about digital because you were a technology editor at the Daily Telegraph as well, but I mean, it doesn't matter what your answer is on the digital questions because I won't understand them, so that'll be an easy bit we'll do towards the end. Good to know. Uh, and finally, because we have to say these things and know where people stand, you supported Rishi Sunak over Liz Truss in the 2022 leadership campaign. I'm never sure what questions to ask, you know, they should be leave versus remain, who you supported in leadership mm -hmm. campaigns, you build up a picture. But just, I mean, you're, you're a prominent, I think you're one of the senior people in the One Nation group of Conservative MPs. Just tell us what that group is, really, for the record. So I think I, I'd characterise One Nation as, as the pragmatists in the middle ground for the party. Like in terms of numbers, it's, it's, the, it's the single biggest block. Mm -hmm. um, there's sort of a hundred plus uh, that, that are sort of op more or less openly declared um, in that sense. Um, and, and it's pragmatism uh, that, that characterizes that. I think if you, it's, it's people who broadly think that if you've got the middle of the population here, we think most people's political views are pretty close to mm -hmm. the sort of, the, the standard deviation is pretty small. And therefore, if you want to be in charge, if you want to do all the good that you believe politics can do, you have to appeal to that centre ground. And, and that's, that's partly an argument about winning elections, and it's partly an argument about what's the right thing to do. I mean, is it fair to characterise you as being on the, l the group as being on the left of the Parliamentary Conservative Party? Or is so that I, too I, think, I, think, I think there's too many of us for that to be the easy characterisation. Right. But, but I think we are we're the numerical and the ideological centre ground, right? There, mm. there, are, there are people who I think would probably think of themselves as, if you think of it in left and right terms, too far to the left, and people who would definitely think of themselves as too far to the right. So, so I, everyone always thinks their own opinions are in yeah. the middle. Uh, but, but I think certainly mine for, for the majority of them. Uh, of what? Um, uh, so I think for the majority of, of us, we would certainly genuinely think of ourselves in that middle ground. Okay. And I mean... Part of me gets the sense that you've never really recovered from the fact that you lost so many of your leading lights. I mean, so many of the MPs who were part of the One Nation group who had a, a strong public profile are former MPs now, aren't they? I mean, you've, you've been particularly hit by that. I, I'm, I'm not sure that's true. I think I, I'm always slightly nervous about uh, sort of I identifying members of the cabinet because they, they can speak for themselves, but people routinely characterise the, the Chancellor, the Education Secretary, the Health Secretary right. as, as, as very much uh, on the One Nation uh, end of the spectrum. So I think Rishi has appointed, uh, a, genuinely tried to appoint a very balanced cabinet that, mm -hmm. that reflects different parts of the party, and, and that is you could argue that that is a necessity of it for any prime minister, but I think it also reflects his sense that it is the middle ground that's where you win elections. I mean, we'll come back to the question about whether it's also a necessity because you happen to have a very divided party at the moment that is quite factionalised. But is it fair? I mean, it, it strikes me as fair to say that despite your size, it's other factions that hog the limelight. I mean, the, the Tories on the right of your party seem to hog the headlines far, far more, and, and, and sometimes to make the running far, far more. Do you think that's fair, or is it just mistaking noise for influence? I, I'd, I'd say some of it is mistaking noise for influence, but I think historically, you're also right that people are, who have thought of themselves as middle ground pragmatists who, who would sort of uh, perhaps lazily characterise themselves as the sensibles, um, mm. have, have allowed themselves to think, well, for the sake of party unity, we need to uh, uh, maybe take on too much from, from one uh, edge of, of thinking. What you've seen over the last year or so is a much more muscular, much more public approach from the One Nation group. And that's partly been a reaction to, as you say, the, mm. the, the noise that's been... Uh, out there, but it's also been a, a genuine desire to say, look, we've got an election coming up. We want that narrative, surely, to be the most electorally attractive. And I simply don't believe that the Tory party's best chance of winning another term comes from uh, looking particularly to one end or the other of Conservative support. 
I mean, is that, is that a sort of complicated way of saying, in some ways, you've just been too bloody reasonable? I mean, I remember thinking, you know, during all the struggles over Brexit, the thing that defined for me the ERG was they were willing to burn the house down. I mean, they were willing to collapse the government, they were willing to issue threats, and, and I always got the sense that even though you had, a, you know, many people in your group had a different agenda to them, everyone knew you weren't as willing as they were to do so, which sort of is a bit of a weakness, isn't it? So I think you're right that pragmatism can, can definitely be seen as a sign of weakness. I think... Uh, the debates over Rwanda have uh, seen us take a, a genuinely more muscular, more uh, firm position mm -hmm. uh, on, on some of this stuff. But I think also, yeah, you're, you're right. There is a, when, when you have a very small majority, as Theresa May did, then relatively small groups get the opportunity to say, thus far and no further and no mm. matter. Uh, and, and I think we are in, uh, currently in numerically different territory for, for the government. Um, and we're also in, uh, we, have, we I, I think, as I say, need to continue to make that case that if you want to appeal to the public, you don't do it from the, the, even the mainstream political parties. You don't do it from the extremes of them. And, and, and the Labour Party found that out via Jeremy Corbyn. We, we, we've seen how that ends. I think there's a, there's a real prospect for the Conservative Party to avoid that fate. But okay. we don't do it by, by veering to one edge. But just, I mean, this is just nosiness, you'd have to answer this if you don't want to, but how does the group work? I mean, to what extent do you say, okay, we've got the Rwanda bill coming forward, let's coordinate a position, let's, I mean, do you, do you meet, do you vote, do you agree on a stance, do you agree that this is our, I mean, I, I remember I, I once, this is a whole different story, went to an ERG meeting, and it was very, very, I mean, it, and it was very formal. You're, you're more in with the Tory party. You know, they, had, <laughs> they, um, had, they had minutes and they had officers and it was, I mean, it's, it's, it's the... So, so, so the, I mean, the practicality is, is that uh, there are weekly meetings on Mondays at six o'clock kind of thing. Um, but there isn't, there's never been uh, a one nation whip in the way that the ERG have talked about uh, having with them. And that is to some extent because there's too many of us. Mm. Um, and, and also, historically, there's always been a big proportion of the group that are serving in government. And, and, and it's, it's very different to ask people uh, to take a position that would require them to uh, speak, in theory, to, to potentially resign a position or, or, or whatever. Uh, so so they're, they're the practicalities. Um, but no, we don't have minutes and we don't have a, a secretary, uh, although I'm quite envious of you going to an ERG meeting. Well, I'll, t I'll, tell you, well, I'll tell you about it later, but I mean, it wasn't that exciting, to be honest. But, uh, I mean, do, so do, uh, this, is the this is just my curiosity. I'm sorry this is boring you all. I'm just quite curious about how these things work. But do, do you know... Who, I mean, do you know who the members are? So, I mean, do you have a list? I mean, is there a WhatsApp group that people get kicked out of or allowed into because they've become one nationed? Or uh, there is there is a very popular WhatsApp group that people sometimes ask to join and are usually admitted to. Okay, all right. Okay, enough about that. So, just in the last whatever five ten years, can you point to specific policies where you just think yes, that is where what we we influence that we that. That policy came out the way it did because we played the game well. So I think there's, there's lots of things. The most obvious recent one is Rwanda, right? Yeah. Where, um, where, where there was a huge and completely legitimate argument about what is the best way to achieve a certain outcome, where there is, uh, so despite reports to the contrary, there, there is almost total unity within the Tory party on the necessity to do a thing, to make immigration policy work. There is a significant disagreement on the best way of doing that. No, no one's going to pretend otherwise. Uh, but the, the fact that Number 10 came out with a bill that was on a knife edge and mm. was under huge pressure to go down one route rather than another um, uh, and stayed where it was. Um, uh, and that is a, a real testament to the uh, relatively greater uh, stubbornness of, of, of the One Nation. And I think that is to all our benefits. Um, I, I think you can go back, so, so lots of people would characterize a lot of the the policies of David Cameron and, 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 and the sort yep. of legacy of David Cameron, that reshaping of the Conservative Party to be both electorally popular and fundamentally more socially liberal mm -hmm. um, as, as, as a one nation uh, agenda. And, and I think 
I, I, that, we are largely, not solely, but we are largely made up of people who joined the Conservative Party, who were elected uh, um, as members of Parliament under the influence of David Cameron. Yeah, um, okay. and, and, and I think it's, it's, it's the lazy version is to say, well, this is the Cameroon end, and, and, and that's not true. The world has moved on uh, somewhat since then. But the, that agenda, whether you think of gay marriage or whether you think of Rwanda or all things in between, that, I think, is where a lot of us would see ourselves. I mean, on the, on the question of David Cameron, did you, did you see his appointment partly as a sort of as a sop to people like you? Did you see that as a sort of internally facing gesture as much as a let's have a foreign secretary with a bloody good address book? Uh, no, I don't think I don't think I, I would have seen it as a as a, a bid to appeal to one part of the party. I think the prime minister genuinely sees him as someone who is bringing a set of unique qualities, um, and, and uh, it's no secret that lots of people have mixed feelings about anyone holding those sorts of offices from the House of Lords, and there are, the, the, the House of Commons is wrestling with how to make sure he is able to. Uh, undergo the kind of scrutiny that uh, that I think is legitimate, uh, but I think a lot of us are very glad to see David back on the front line of politics. You can pass on this one, but is he in the WhatsApp group? <laughs> no, he isn't. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, just on immigration, actually, you know, I genuinely don't know this. So you say there's a degree of unity in the Conservative Party on dealing, presumably, with the small boats, the sort of irregular. But when it comes to legal immigration, there are, I mean, you know, I remember Liz Truss as Prime Minister hinting that she wanted to liberalise things yet further. I mean, is there a, are the One Nation group relatively comfortable with where regular immigration is at the moment? Is there a concern about the number? I mean, do you have a... So I, th I think there's a broad consensus across the party, wherever, wherever you see it, that those numbers of both legal and illegal migration are, are very high mm -hmm. and don't have broad public consent, if, if that makes sense. And I, I'm, I'm, mine is a constituency where immigration has always been a huge issue um, since the uh, liberalisation of, of uh, EU immigration rules, and we saw huge yeah. expansion uh, in, in places like Boston where agricultural work was this magnet, mm. um, and there were no transitional controls. So, so I, on, a, on a personal level, I'm acutely aware uh, of the strains that that puts um, to some extent on public services, but, mm -hmm. but it's also a, a mixed bag. I, I'm conscious that on the one hand, my local GPs are under a lot of pressure because of immigration. On the other hand, the maternity unit is still open because of immigration. So uh, it, it is swings and roundabouts. On the other hand, the challenge comes around public consent. The, the, the mm -hmm. challenge comes around uh, saying to people, for instance, in an area like mine, you've seen huge change over a very short period of time. Do you feel like anyone ever had that conversation with you? And certainly in a place like Boston, the answer is simply no. Uh, and under the new system, I mean, one of the things I always figured about the new system was the numbers might be high, but the geography would be different. That's to say, people coming in, earning over the salary cap, having a job. In, in your constituency, have numbers come down, or is it far less obvious that immigration is as much an issue as it was under freedom of movement when you got those agricultural workers? So, relatively, yes, um, numbers have come down, uh, but that's largely because these are largely seasonal agricultural workers, there is a seasonal agricultural scheme, the countries that we used to uh, take those people from now themselves have seasonal worker schemes to try and uh, right. attract people. So, so it is, it's much more nuanced than simply being a Brexit conversation. Where the challenge comes still is around, uh, for instance, um, the local council elections recently were fought very much around people's perception of public safety in the town and, and, and community issues that are not so much around cohesion anymore, but they are around pressure on public services and, and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a, there's a, a very, uh, there's a new, but there's a new debate around it post Brexit, but it is it has got a lot in common with the previous one as well. And just just quickly, just touching again on the sort of various groups in the Conservative Party, is there a sort of a route for the One Nation group's involvement in the manifesto drafting process? I mean, does do people jostle, you know, the various research groups? And I've lost count of them. I mean, you know, does everyone say, well, we need a we need it? I mean, how does that work? So, I mean, there's a, there's a route for everybody, right? And there there has been different approaches to writing manifestos over the certainly over all the elections. Uh, that I've been involved in, and mm -hmm. some have been incredibly tight, and some have been much longer processes and, and much more drawn out. Ultimately, it'll be for the PM to decide where he wants to go, but I do think the case that 
we will make, and, and obviously we'll, we'll continue to make, is look, what it, you, can, you can look at the polling and you can look at the practical effects, and, and those middle ground policies are broadly uh, what people say they're going to vote for, and that is not a way of saying that you should be... We're, I, don't, I don't think of myself as the nanny state end of the Tory party, okay. but I do think of myself as someone who acknowledges that there are certain things only government can do. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that might, some of that is relatively mundane. Some of that is around making sure we have effective nationwide recycling schemes or whatever. Mm. But read, read the important stuff, um, but not retail. And paying for childcare. Yeah, ex exactly. Not, but, and, and childcare is very much a retail policy. Mm. Uh, recycling, I, I chose as an example something that very much isn't, right? Um, and, and I think we, we need to acknowledge that the recent history of politics that says deregulate everything, government gets out the way at every opportunity, has not been as politically successful as some people had hoped. Is the Prime Minister a One Nation Tory? Uh, I think all Prime Ministers, and this, this sounds like a fudgy answer, and I, I mean it to genuinely be sincere, I, I think all Prime Ministers have to ride several different horses, yeah. if, if that makes sense. Um, I think there are some areas where, where the PM is, is much more uh, so uh, e economically uh, to, to the right of most one nation instincts, and there are some things where he's, he's the other way, and, and I think that's inherent in the job that he has to do. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't, I, I would, I suppose there are definitely some areas where I would say things like childcare, which even some parts of the Conservative Party are, are uncomfortable with, should be absolutely core to what we're doing. And I think that's one example of a flagship policy where he's very much on board with it, and I'd characterise it as very much a one nation policy. OK, and we hear a lot from Conservative MPs that the Conservative Party is a broad church, but I sort of sometimes get the sense that it's a sort of church where you can't even see one pew from the next, because it's... it's I mean, is, is it... Are you worried that the party itself is becoming ungovernable? Because it just feels and appears very divided day on day to the so outsider. I, I, I think these are my... Our respective predecessors, if such a thing exists, have been asking that question for as long as the Tory party has existed. Yep. And there's a Labour Party end over the, metaphorically over the other side of Bush House that's doing the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. when, when, when Jeremy Corbyn was in charge, people were yep. saying, this is obviously unsustainable. Mm -hmm. um, and it turns out, lo and behold, partly because of the electoral system we have, partly because of the strength of the brand, all of that, um, then, then everyone always worries that parties are too broad. The, the reality is the way you secure a majority in, mm -hmm. uh, in, in this country is by, I think, having parties that are uh, so, uh, so, so broad that they start to strain at the edges, but not so broad that they break. Um, and and that, is a, that is genuinely a sign of strength, and we haven't seen that kind of uh, split for a long time, and I don't think there's any evidence that we're going to see it anytime soon either. The One Nation Group backed Boris Johnson, didn't it, I think? Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, to, well, so, so that's not quite. That's not quite fair. Um, the, the One Nation has never had a candidate, right? Um, but lots of One Nation people uh, back Boris Johnson for a whole host of reasons. Um, uh, partly because uh, we're, we're not uh, blind to obvious electoral track records, mm -hmm. um, but, but also if you look at. Boris's record in London in, in lots and lots of ways, uh, the idea that he was the Brexit Prime Minister and had all of the characteristics of the typical Brexiteer is simply not borne out by the facts. So, so I think you've got to be, uh, you've one, got to acknowledge that in a big group there's always going to be a diversity of views mm. on, on leadership candidates as well, but also to say inevitably uh, it was obvious at, at the time that Boris was, I think, the right man for the job. Would it be fair to say that, that, that one of the consequences of Brexit has been to drive the Conservative Party, not in economic, but in values terms, to the right? I mean, you lost a lot of the sort of more liberal, the Liddingtons, the Rory Stewarts, and so on. Uh, and, you know, you've got a lot of new MPs who talk a very different language on cultural matters to One Nation Conservatives. I'm not sure that's true. I, th I think what Brexit did was reset a huge chunk of the pitch. If, yeah. if that makes sense. And if you look at people who were elected in, in 2017 and 2019, um, they are, I think, themselves significantly more diverse in their views mm. and, and in their backgrounds than the Tory party has been for a long time. Uh, that is a huge strength. There's obviously a very live debate about how sustainable that electoral coalition ever was um, yeah. and, and, and where it will end up in the future. But it, it does seem to me that 
you're right that Brexit reset a lot of things. I'm not sure there's a lot of evidence that it simply shifted everyone to the right. Um, and especially if you look at the people who are uh, 17 and 19 uh, elections and are now in the cabinet, I don't think there's a lot of evidence mm. for that at all. Okay, you said, I mean, you said actually we don't put up a single candidate. Is that something that might change? Why not? I mean, is that something, were there to be, and this is hypothetical upon hypothetical, imagine the Conservatives lost the election and there was a leadership election, would, why wouldn't the One Nation group put up a candidate? Or might they? So, well, I, I, all I'd say is, obviously, within all of those hypotheticals, you can at least look to the past, which is to say, in a big group, you will have a different, you, you will have a range of people that have a range of views on who is likely to be the most successful person. Yeah, okay. Uh, now, one of the fascinating, there's loads of fascinating things about you and your position, one of which is that your, uh, your constituency was found in recent polling to be one of the very, very few places where Brexit is not regretted. Uh, why? What is, I mean, what is there about you? I mean, is, is there something, it's genuinely interested to know whether there is something specific about your constituency uh, I mean, there, 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 are, there are umpteen answers to that. One of, one of the answers to, to the direct question is that ultimately it was, we, we've seen in polling terms, ignore, ignore the sort of political arguments, in pure polling terms, you're right to highlight that uh, Brexit, support for Brexit has diminished in mm -hmm. lots and lots of places. Uh, mine was the constituency that voted for it more than anywhere else. Um, so, so in pure numerical terms, it, it's got further to fall. That's, that's a a maths point, not a politics point. Um, uh, what I would say is if you remember the opening of the uh, BBC's coverage on uh, the night of the Brexit referendum, mm -hmm. uh, in the background they had by council the most likely to vote remain to the most likely to vote leave. Um, Boston Borough Council was from the very off most likely to vote leave by a long way. Um, and that was uh, driven uh, in many ways by immigration, driven by the fact that in 10 years the town had grown by a, a third um, and almost all of that one third of, of people had come from Eastern Europe, Eastern. had come to work, um, had come to do jobs that otherwise would have been vacant, but mm -hmm. nonetheless had changed the tech character of the town immensely and people didn't feel that that was a, something there was public consent for. Um, but it is also uh, a part of the world where there is, it is genuinely true, when I was knocking on doors, when I was standing in, in the marketplace in the run-up to the election, people were talking to me about all the issues that people imagined they were, about sovereignty, about mm -hmm. wanting to make their own decisions. Um, and, and, and that is a really strong strain across Lincolnshire. Lincolnshire, when we had the first referendum in the 70s, voted very strongly to uh, join the EU um, and subsequently voted uh, very strongly to leave the EU. So, so it has always been at the edge of, of those debates. And has it been uncomfortable being the MP for that constituency as a Remainer? I mean, well, I, I, I was really honest from the start that at the very beginning, my vote is worth no more than anyone else's. As an individual, what I said was uh, the, I, I think, to some extent, uh, powerful but uh, fundamentally not powerful enough uh, argument that the Remain campaign made, which is whatever you identify as your problems, Brexit is not the panacea that will fix every single one of them. Um, and uh, I, th I think that that is, insofar as it goes, that, that is true. I don't think anyone mm. uh, really would, would think that it ever was. But um, what I also said was, look, whatever the result is, I will in Parliament, when I'm representing you, absolutely respect that. And people are much more interested in your uh, actions in Parliament than they are in your individual role at the ballot box. And I think that's been actually quite a rewarding experience in some ways, because it, for all that politics is personal sometimes, voters understand that your role is to represent them. And when you have a referendum, you do, to some extent, become a delegate. Yeah, um, and, I th and I think that is something that some of my colleagues in Parliament uh, didn't want to accept. Hmm. But the referendum vote didn't stipulate a kind of Brexit. I mean, would you like us to have a closer relationship with the European Union than we do? So I think the the premise of the Brexiteer argument actually was that we would have uh, the most mutually advantageous 
uh, relationship with the, with the EU that we could um, after we'd left, because it would be obvious that the economics made a certain case, that, mm -hmm. the, uh, that, that cooperation made sense, whether it's on horizon, whether it's on a whole host of things. Um, and I think what you are seeing is the gradual maturing of that relationship, mm -hmm. which is still absolutely, it is genuinely hugely important that we respect that result and, and that there are some, some real and meaningful dividing lines. But in the maturing of that relationship, we're seeing pragmatic decisions on horizon. Um, the forthcoming set of checks on goods going uh, across the channel are gonna be a real test of mm. how pragmatic are people prepared to be? What, what does the mixture of pragmatism and uh, bureaucracy end up looking like? Uh, and, and I think that is going to be something where uh, mutual self-interest should be more important than bureaucratic dogma. But would you and would your colleagues in the One Nation group, for instance, be comfortable, imagine again this hypothetical Labour government, if they come in, it looks like they're going to negotiate things like a veterinary agreement and things like that. Would you like to see those things become wedge issues? Because there'll be some in your party who say, we turn this into a wedge issue. They're reneging on Brexit. But actually, you could argue it's showing exactly the sort of pragmatism you were talking about. So I, I think to some extent the devil is in the detail, but my, my broad answer is what makes it easier and simpler for Joe Public out there to see mm. what, what is in his or her interest. And I would absolutely say it's in his or her interest for us to look at where does the future growth in trade around the world come from. Mm -hmm. And that means you shouldn't pretend the CPTPP doesn't exist, for yeah. instance. But you also shouldn't pretend that there are obvious advantages of being uh, closer to our nearest neighbours than we are to some of our further neighbours. Okay. And you can have further neighbours. <laughs> What do, you, do you think that the, the, the whole Brexit saga has impacted on the Conservative Party's relationship with business? I mean, Conservatives used to be the party of business, and one of the things, particularly in the early stages of Brexit, was that relations between the first May government and business seemed almost sort of confrontational on, on occasion. Do you think that damage is long-lasting? So I think there are two things. I, I think fundamentally, important though it is to be talking about the, the, the different bits of the Tory party. The, the conversation that all of us should want to be having is about the Labour Party, is about what the future opportunities a Conservative government could provide will mm -hmm. look like and what the future risks of, of a Labour government will look like. And, and I think in some ways, I've, I, I guess that over the eight, nine years I've been doing this, I, I've discovered I'm a slightly more tribal Tory than I thought. <laughs> um, and, and, and I think uh, that is, maybe it's, maybe it's because you sort of are up close and personal with the Labour Party to, to some extent in, in, in the chamber. Um, but, but I really passionately believe that the policies that, and the values that set up conservative thinking will be better for business, will be better for individuals um, than those that we're seeing uh, across the other side, no matter how much there might be a pretense that they've changed fundamentally from what they were just a few years ago. And I think uh, it is, we've got a huge job to do, uh, not, I, I wouldn't characterise it as post-Brexit, but we've got a huge job to do currently to make the case to the business community <coughs> that uh, there is a reason why the tax burden is currently where it is, mm -hmm. and there is a plan and a genuine prospect of bringing it down while simultaneously improving the public services that ultimately on one level get us elected. So, so I think that's a very long-winded way of saying we have got a job to do, mm. that is a challenge, but I think uh, the idea that sort of business is somehow separate from politics yeah, yeah. Is, 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 is not quite right. Like you talk, you talk when, when I was Minister for Broadband talking to, to big chief execs of major companies, they understood, of course they understood that there was a political necessity for the way we were approaching Brexit. That didn't mean uh, that they also thought that there wasn't a conversation to be had about what policies that were business friendly might look like. I mean, it's interesting, I mean, the, the sort of economic pitch you made, would you be uncomfortable if the party went towards the next election majoring on immigration, leaving the ECHR and things like that? Because there are some people in your party who seem to think that that's the path. Well, I'd, I'd be uncomfortable because I think it wouldn't be a vote-winning opportunity. Um, right. Like, I, I think there are, I mean, I, I think, and, and I've, I've said 
publicly lost. I think the ECHR needs some really fundamental reform. Yeah. Um, and I think the Refugee Convention needs some really fundamental reform. And I think there's lots of those big, there's, in, in the Rwanda Bill, there's, there's half a dozen of the, of the big treaties sort of named explicitly, and no one thinks any of them is perfect. Um, and, and I think you do have to countenance the prospect that if you sit there and say something needs really fundamental reform and you don't get it, and you're saying it's fundamentally broken, what do you do then? Um, and I think that's an open question. At that point, you have to say, well, okay, this is what the best looks like, and this is what not being in it might look like, and how do you make that, yeah. make that call? But my starting point is it's in everyone's interest, for instance, to pursue multilaterally that, that reform program. I don't think that while there are, there are, of course, significant numbers of people who would say it is... Uh, immigration and the ECHR that is the crucial uh, issue for the next election. I think the reality is, and the polling says, that it is the economy, it is the NHS, mm. it is public services, and so uh, wedge issues are important, they demonstrate whose side you're on, but they can't be the main debate. And do you get uncomfortable with some of the wedge issues? I mean, what is the trans issues being in the news a lot after PMQs last week and things like that? Do you sort of, sort of think, actually, we could dial this down a bit. I mean, it's not very one nation, is it? So I, I worry that sometimes we talk about things in a way that obscure the big picture, mm. right? And, and, and I think that is, um, that, that is an important starting point. I, I do think that it is not for politicians of any flavour to reach too far into people's personal lives mm. and, and, and to take to take the trans debate as, 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 a, as just one example. There are huge chunks of that debate where it is for the state to consider what it means for aspects of health policy, what it means for aspects of mm -hmm. prisons policy. What, what the, the, those are important. But in the vast majority of cases, uh, I, I believe in letting people live their own lives according to their own, uh, their own choices. And, and that means that you can stay out of a lot of it. Well, but it also means that in some areas the state has to step in to ensure mm. that people have the freedom to live those lives. Yeah, ab absolutely. And, and, and I think uh, that does... So, uh, I don't know, to take uh, another example of uh, buffer zones around abortion clinics, for yeah. instance, where there are, uh, there are strong views um, in the, it's, it, it, amongst the people of so strongly held faith of, of both mm -hmm. parties are, are, around, around lots of this stuff. And I think what, what I've always voted for, what, what I think lots of people are on, uh, I wouldn't split it solely along this, but what lots of One, one Nation is for that uh, legislating to allow people to get on with doing difficult things in difficult circumstances unimpeded by other people's views. Mm. Um, and, and I think you can have a big policy debate about trans issues or abortion or, or, or whatever, um, that is not the same thing as permitting personally provocative protest. Okay. I mean, the other issue that has looked like it might be a, a wedge issue uh, has been net zero. Uh, what do you make of the Prime Minister's, well, I'm trying to think of the appropriate word, softening, if you like, of government policy or slight shifts to government policy? Has that, has that concerned you that, I mean, it, there are signs, I mean, the they're more marked in other countries than this one at the moment, that this is becoming politicised mm. and is turning into an issue where the right in particular is saying, you know, we should push back on this. So, so I think, again, I, I do tend to look to the constituency. So mine is a big rural constituency, yeah. huge numbers of people off the mains, gas grid, um, uh, lots of people where uh, the idea that you're going to, I know, the, the banning wood burners conversation, yeah. for instance, like that, that is simply not viable. And, and, and the Prime Minister's softening the slope from one place to another, um, it, it, to me, in, in an area like mine, for lots of issues, is simply the only practical option. Like they, you, 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 can, you can be wishful thinking about heat pumps and all of that, but um, it, it, is not, it is not always the, the plan that you can pursue. What I do think, on, on a sort of higher level than the parochial, if, if, if you like, is we do have to say, people say more than anything else, they care about this issue in 
theory. We know it's the In your right constituency thing. included? Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Okay. Um, and, and, and we know that it's the right thing to do from a climate point of view. We've got to find a way of doing the, the sort of the, 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 the challenging dual thing that people failed to do around when they wanted to win the Remain argument for Brexit is to say, look, it's not just pragmatically in your interest to do this, but you've got to believe in it. You've got to win the argument as well as uh, you get a stick out, whether it's taxation or, or, or banning gas boilers or whatever. And I think there are some parts of the country, be it geographically, where, where they might be particularly rural, where that argument is a long way from one. Um, mm. and, and it is not just for government to play that role, uh, but I do think it shouldn't be the case that you end up in a position where you say, look, we can, uh, we can leave this for the next generation, because at some point you run out of generations. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I find most irritating about the debate is this slightly sort of patronising attitude in the South that, you know, the oiks up north aren't going to support net zero, are they? And actually, there's no polling that supports this whatsoever. I mean, but there are some very lazy assumptions about, you know, those voters won't, won't want to buy into this. And so I think we get we get dangerously close to those uh, the, the polls that said sort of people who voted for Brexit were less educated and, and, and yeah. that sort of thing. And, and I think um, there, there are two problems with it. So that sort of one. Uh, scratch the surface and it's not wholly true. Uh, two, the votes of people who are less educated or live in different places are not worth less than the votes of people who, 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 vote, who yeah. are more educated. You've got to grapple with that and you've got to win arguments in different ways. So just, just panning out, what, what, what parts of the Conservative Party's record since 2019 are you most proud of? Well, I think if you look at post-2019, actually delivering when we came in after that election, mm. um, then it was in a real democratic crisis. We ended up having that election because Parliament was fundamentally broken. We had, we had a fixed-term Parliament Act that was mm -hmm. working, in theory, really well, right up until Parliament had to do something really difficult. Yep. And, 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 and I think, actually, the, uh, the combat... Of course, the pandemic has shifted huge chunks of this. Um, but you do have to say uh, cutting the Gordian knot that was Brexit is, in order to move the political debate on, is something that was an absolute necessity. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think you also, I think it's fair to look at the sort of longer conservative trajectory rather than simply since since 2019 and say yep. whether it's whether it's school standards whether it's equal marriage whether it's the rise of uh, wh whether it's the rise of the British tech scene in, in a way that is absolutely unprecedented anywhere around the world um, given where we where we started from there are huge chunks of things that the Tory party should be very much on the front foot fighting the next election on and that's partly about pride in the record, but it's also partly about saying, look, do you really think uh, that there were better options available, and do you really think that an alternative party would have made better choices? And I think mm. we should be braver and more confident about making that case. And that doesn't mean getting angry about it, and it doesn't mean say, promising more political excitement than perhaps we've had in the last few years, uh, but, but it does mean uh, saying, look, it is, you take education as one example, it, it is a pure fact that since the Conservatives have been in power, we have rocketed up the, lead, yeah. up, up the yeah. international tables in English, in maths, in research, and in, in all that. So I think there's lots to be proud of, and there's a danger that we buy into the sort of nihilistic narrative ar around the world. I can't remember what the issue was that week when the PISA things came out that showed mm -hmm. that we'd gone up, and I was absolutely struck by the fact that the Prime Minister went off on some cultural thing, and I was thinking... Sure, 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 you should be talking about... Uh, I, I, th I think events might have intervened in the government grid, perhaps. Uh, but but, but, I, but I, look, I, I, I think it, it is absolutely true um, that those things are things that we should be talking about. That mm. There is a whole generation of children that have been through schools under a Conservative government that have proportionally, if you like, got better results than their predecessors did under a Labour government. You can talk mm. about unemployment, you can talk about the economy, you can talk about, talk about all of these things. Um, we should be confident and proud of that, and we should be talking about it in a way uh, that makes it clear that there is a lot at stake mm -hmm. come the next election. And, and I think that doesn't mean deviating from that centre ground. It means making the case in the centre ground. But on education, are you slightly concerned that 
the government has slightly failed to deal with the issue of sort of COVID catch-up. I mean, you had the... Mm. You had the education czar who resigned, Kevin Collins, saying we need 15 billion for COVID catch-up, and the government provided, I think, 1.4 or something. Are you, does that not concern you that actually there is there are a lot of kids, particularly kids from deprived backgrounds, who, because of COVID, are going to just fall further behind? Uh, so I, I think you're absolutely right that there is a huge there, there is a catch-up generation, yeah. if, if you like, um, and, and there, there we've got sort of there are two generations that. that Worry me if you, if, if you like. One from a sort of political appeal point of view. Um, one is, and I'm not that far away from this myself. One is people who came of age in the wake of the financial crash, and 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 they and they are uh, people where essentially wages have stagnated for 15 years, and and that is there are good reasons why things couldn't have been done particularly differently or, or better, but it's a hard political argument. Yeah. Um, and, and the other um, is, as you say, the people. Uh, who were at school and their parents during um, that period, where there is a lot of things that we could have done with money, there are, but there are lots of things that, that money couldn't buy, um, the kind of uh, new approach that we need to try and deal with the mental health consequences of COVID, that we, try, that we need to try and deal with the, there is lots of evidence of changing attitude to just simply going to school. Like, mm. uh, co w w we shouldn't underestimate the persistent culture. absentee. Yeah, yeah, we shouldn't underestimate yeah. the cultural impact of COVID, um, as well as the as, as well as the sort of pure educational yeah. catch-up. Yeah, but surely the, the biggest single issue your party faces is that you've lost the reputation for economic competence, and and history suggests you don't you don't win that back until the other party loses theirs. Uh, so I mean, but if you, if you take the broad sweep of history, you've got Black Wednesday. And actually, when is that reversed? It's reversed in 2008 when Labour have the great financial crisis. And when is that reversed? It's reversed with the mini budget and mm -hmm. Liz Truss. I mean, th there's nothing you can do about that, is there? Well, I think there's reality and there's reputation. You can, you can make uh, a very good case for uh, Britain's relative success uh, post-pandemic and outside the EU, whether you want to get hung up on, on, on the inside, mm -hmm. in, inside or outside of, of, of the UK. You can make a really good case for... Uh, Conservative policy is delivering growth that has simply not happened in lots of our lots of our sort of competitor countries. Now, I, I would I would like ours to be even better than it is, um, and, and frankly, I'd like theirs to be better than it is as well. Mm -hmm. um, this, this, we, this shouldn't be a, a, a this isn't a winners and losers kind of conversation. Um, but uh, that you're right that there is, there are some facts that you can get out there. You can talk about employment. You can talk about inflation. People can see and feel those records and they can see and feel the tax cuts that are made possible by them, you've also got to have a perception conversation. Um, and, and I think trying to sell that future vision in a credible way is why, on the one hand, I absolutely want the Chancellor to spend every single penny of headroom he's got come the next budget. What I don't want him to do is spend any more than that, because the way that you could really further damage uh, the Conservative Party's uh, reputation on the economy would be to uh, leave something that didn't feel credible. And, and that headroom is, to an extent, is fictional, isn't it? Because, I mean, the, the projections for the next three or four years that say, OK, we're going to meet the target of the fiscal rule are based on spending projections that are just politically unsustainable, surely. I mean, the, the, the scale of cuts that are implied in the spending plans for 26, 27, 28 are just not politically deliverable. Well, I, I, I think, I mean, the, the, the straight answer to your question is that the headroom is dictated by forecasts, right? And, yeah. And those, those forecasts are, are, are real things that, pr that provide... Uh, a, a, an actual envelope. Uh, you are, I think, right that there are going to be, whoever's in power, some really tough conversations mm -hmm. over the next few years, some of which is basically about, look, we've got huge uh, challenges, be they the sort of legacy cost of COVID, be they inflation, be they the sort of broader consequences of war in Europe on our doorstep, and we're going to have, uh, I think, an obvious need to spend more on defence than we have uh, relatively recently over the next few years because we face different and, and, and greater threats. So there's going to be some big potential increases required yep. 
and there's going to be uh, a sensible conversation that needs to be had around how you uh, make some sensible savings in places. So, so I'm, I'm not disputing in some ways... Uh, no, no, it's a tight fiscal environment. Yeah, exa exactly. But, but I do think we've got to be honest with the public in the way that, at the end of the day, both Labour and the Conservative Party in 2010 were promising cuts. They were saying, we are going to make the books work. Um, and the public understood that, being honest with people about what the environment is really going to look like is, is really important. That's not the same thing as saying that we have to relive the post-2010 uh, austerity by any means. But in that, I mean, given all that, it's hardly helpful, is it, that so many of your colleagues in this fiscal environment are banging on about tax cuts? That's hardly fiscally responsible, is it? So I think there is a, there is a balance here, right? Mm -hmm. the, uh, the tax burden is, is at enormously uh, high levels historically. It's not doing, it's not delivering the public services that people think they are paying for. Yeah. Um, now, you have to have a conversation, I think, that either says, right, do you think what we should be doing is putting taxes up and up and up and up, and then you will magically get the NHS you think you're paying for? Yeah. Or are you going to be able to say, look, the way that you deliver what you need is around re pragmatic reform and around uh, saying that it is not always the highest tax rates that deliver yeah. the highest amount into the Treasury? Hang on, I've lost my voice now. I'm sort of confusing myself. Bear with me. Does it matter? I, mean, I, was, I was listening to the radio this morning, listening to the Today programme, we were talking about recessions, technical recessions and all of this. When you talk to your constituents, does, does that resonate? Is that an issue? So I think... I mean, obviously it matters if the economy isn't doing very well, sure. Yeah, but yeah, does this... yeah exactly. Yeah. I, I think no, no one has ever said to me, um, I'm furious GDP is at, 0, is at minus 0 0.3, it should be at minus 0 0.1, or, or whatever. Like, yeah. The, the, yeah. The, the difference between a technical recession and, a, 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 and anything else is not what people talk about. What people do talk about is inflation, it, mm -hmm. are, are the things that make you feel uh, richer or poorer. And, and, and I think, for instance, there was a period when inflation was massively outstripping wage rises. It's now, wage rises are now slightly outstripping inflation. So I think where people feel they are um, is much more important than, than what the OBR has, has come up with. That's, that's important. Of course it's important and it's what sets the envelope for you to make those decisions. But I don't think in the main when people talk to me about so what are the big issues, they are dentists, they are potholes, they are the one, the sort of, the sort of table stakes basic stuff. I, uh, the answer to those people is never, well, if GDP was a bit higher, then we could fix more potholes. You, you've, got yeah. to, you've, got, you've got to have, but that is the answer, right, on one, yeah. one level. Um, but you, so, so you've got to have the com you've got to have those conversations on its own. But you don't say sense. GDP, was like you say growth. That's, that's well, even, even, if, even if you say growth, sort of bit of, um, uh, with the exception of some of my colleagues in Parliament, most people's eyes do glaze over. Mm -hmm. um, so so, so I, th I think you have, to be, you, you have to have these conversations in the, in the language that people come to you with, in the, in the same way that I, if someone emails me, I'll email them back rather than send them a letter, kind of thing. Like you, you, you've, got, you've got to, I think, have that. Uh, you, you've got to be able to have an eye on what does communication look like. But, but yeah, like, oh, it does matter. Of course it mm. matters. But what, what people say matters is, is the, the things that feel more immediate. Yeah. Talking about glazing over, I saw this fantastic Harold Wilson quote the other day when he was asked, you know, what, what is the art of dealing with a difficult question in politics? And apparently Harold Wilson said, well, I've got a trick for this. If you start your answer with as we discussed in Parliament last week. No one listens to the second half of your answer because they're so bored already. So there's a, there's a trick you might want to try. Now, I mean, you, you're, 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 at, you're, you're, doing, you're doing a remarkably good job at, spend, at spinning a sort of relatively upbeat picture here. <laughs> but I mean, you know, let's face it, the, the mood amongst your colleagues in the Parliamentary Conservative Party is going to be pretty low at the moment. There is a, there is a morale well, It's issue, got a lot better it? over the last week. Um, and and, and, I, and I, I, would, I, would, I, I would say, uh, that's, that's a slightly glib answer, but, but, the, but the, the underlying truth behind it <coughs> is I, I sincerely believe that if you look at what happens to Labour policy under uh, any kind of scrutiny, if you look at the reality of the judgments that Keir Starmer's made over the last few weeks, 
it's no longer the case that you have to say, look at Wales and you can see how Labour will govern and their waiting lists are far longer and their track record is, is, is far worse and every speed limit is now 10, 20 miles an hour. Like, do you really want to live there? You don't have to even say that anymore. What you, uh, what, what, what you, what you can say is look at the decisions that Keir Starmer is making, even as leader of the opposition. Do you really want his Labour Party running the country, and I think that is something that should inspire, does inspire, much greater unity. And, and on one level, albeit in, in relatively bleak circumstances, much greater optimism um, amongst Conservative colleagues. And, and I, I look, I've, I've always looked at those polls and thought, we are not facing an opposition that deserves that lead. And, and there, is a, there, there is a genuine... There, there is a, a national interest case, there is a moral case, and there is a really practical look at the other guy's case for a, for a really good Conservative performance at the next election. Though that, that sort of unity is going to prove quite fragile if you lose two by-elections tonight, isn't it? Um, are we allowed to talk about by-elections yet? Um, I, I think... <laughs> Just uh, quickly. When, when do the polls close? Um, <laughs> so, so, look, all, all I would say is... You look at the previous by-elections, then uh, there is a lot of reason for Conservatives to mm -hmm. be pessimistic. Um, it, it, if, if you look at the history of by-elections under governments of all flavours, over parliaments going back 100 years, they are not the best predict predict predictor for general election results, um, and quite right too. And most of that is because the turnout is about half what it would be in the election. Yeah, OK, fair enough. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break with tradition and take a question from... I'm taking a question from Slido because it says it's from Patrick Bamford. And someone obviously knows their way to my heart as one of my favourite footballers. And it gives you a chance <laughs> to do your pitch. As a One Nation Conservative Party member of many years who left the party because of Brexit, Johnson and Truss, why should I come back? Oh, I think if you look at what this current Conservative Party is offering, it is about saying there is a huge track record that we should be proud of. There is all of that stuff, whether it is education, whether it's the way that we have uh, navigated the challenges that have faced the country recently, all of those things indicate that this is an election that will be fought and won in the centre ground. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you really want to, uh, at the risk of sounding like the CCHQ lines, they, 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 they are... They well, this has teed you up for that, hasn't it? They, they, they are, they are, they are, thank you, Patrick. They, they, they are a, they, 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 they are... Imagine if it is Patrick Bamford. I mean, this is so exciting. There is, there is, there is, CCHQ undercover. Um, <laughs> there, 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 there is a, there, there is a real argument to say, do you really want to go back to all of those problems that were inherited in 2010? And there is a real argument to say, do you really want uh, to trust uh, a set of arguments from a party that won't say what it will do because it doesn't have a plan. Like that, all of those lines, which you'll hear time and time again, they are not just lines, they are a real case for sensible political decision making. But isn't the fundamental flaw that if you say, do you want to go back to square one, a large number of people say, yeah, actually. I mean, so I, I, I think that you're right that there are a number of people who would say they don't like the square we're currently in. Yeah. Um, I, I think uh, what the party has to do is to keep making the case that uh, it's easy to say you've been in power for however many years uh, and, and everything is not perfect. What we do have to do is keep talking about uh, all of those achievements, which is something, not, not all of which everyone will like, and say, look, there is a real risk uh, that a lot, a lot of that is jeopardised, and there is a huge risk that for all the sort of ostensible superficial changes, um, that the party that people are thinking about electing hasn't changed in anything like the ways that Keir Starmer might wish. And we see that in the debacle over Rochdale, we see that uh, in the debacle over, uh, um, uh, over uh, how people voted with the most recent ceasefire vote, we'll see it in the next ceasefire vote on Wednesday. I think there are lots and lots of really good reasons to be profoundly sceptical about the suggestion that the Labour Party has changed in anything like uh, the way that Keir Starmer I mean, might wish. Voting for a ceasefire is not being anti-Semitic. Uh, no, I'm not, well, I'm not suggesting it is, but what I am saying is that the idea that you have got a, uh, a suddenly unified uh, Labour Party, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's simply not true. 
and, yeah. and, 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 and I think you've got to... We, 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 it's we, a broad we, church. Yeah, yeah exactly. We, we, it's, it's, it's a broad church, but it's the broad church that was uh, rightly uh, saw the result that it got under Jeremy Corbyn. And, a lot, and, and I, I do come back to the things that lots of my constituents say. They will say, they will say that, is, is this the Keir Starmer who wanted Jeremy Corbyn, Corbyn to be Prime Minister, or the Keir Starmer that wants Keir Starmer to be Prime Minister? Like, you, you've got to put your uh, colours out there and say, what are you prepared to do to get power? And if you're really going to go as far as Keir Starmer has gone, that is, that is a challenging set of environments for people to make a pitch from. Mm. I mean, I've got to ask you this, I mean, given your, your expertise and your former career, as the election approaches, how worried are you and should we be about disinformation, deep fakes? Um, very, is the short answer. Um, if I'm honest, I'm more worried about the impact of all of that on the US election, mm -hmm. um, which will probably come before ours. Um, and, and I think... You've heard it here first. The, 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 sorry, you've, you've heard it from other people as well. Um, if you've heard it here first, you weren't listening. Um, uh, but the, uh, but I, I, th I think that is obviously a magnet for all mm. of those uh, bad actors. Uh, and, and I think it is also going to be a test case for lots and lots of things. And we will be... Uh, there is danger that we are the sort of second version uh, of some of that. And I think there is lots of it to be genuinely worried about. The real problem in some ways is not that it's not illegal yet. Like we've got lots of really good legislation that says yeah. you can't do this, that and the other um, in pursuit of someone's vote. Um, what we haven't got is the technology to stop it mm. happening. So it's more of a, an implementation crisis than it is a, 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 a policy crisis. I have to say, I've seen, and I've been out there recently, that I think that India is going to be a proving ground for a yeah, lot of that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Because of the proliferation of technology and so much tech savvy that I think India, the Indian election yeah. is going to be absolutely haunted by this. But So, I mean, you were a journalist. You worked at The Telegraph before coming into politics. And I suppose one question I'd, I'd just like to know is, did politics live up to what you thought it would? I mean, what... what <laughs> Has politics disappointed you? Has it sort of exceeded expectations? Mean, you weren't to know you were entering for the period that you witnessed. No. Um, so uh, I, I think I people people always was uh, the, the first question, and you haven't fallen into this trap. The first question that people ask is why why did you want to do something that was so fundamentally different um, from what you were doing before? And my sort of part of my job every year was to go and review the new, new iPhone, sort of when when people were literally sleeping outside to queue up for it. So yeah. it was sort of it was, it was a pretty cool thing to be doing um, and an amazing thing to be paid to do. Um, and, 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 and people are like, that's so different from, from what you're going, going to do now. Um, and actually, I, I think there's a huge amount of common ground, it, is that it's about being... Um, m most of journalism is about talking to people and building coalitions, if, if, if you like, in, in some ways, um, of people who want to talk to you. And, and the bit of journalism that, that I was doing was largely about trying to... Uh, actually, for, for all the sort of excitement of re reviewing iPhones, it, it was it was more about trying to nudge government into a certain policy direction, whether mm. it was around broadband or online safety or, or whatever. Um, so I didn't I didn't actually sort of come into it thinking these are radically different things. Okay. Uh, but I did think that it is something where you are uh, closer to being on the pitch than being a spectator. Um, but I think even all of the it's sort of uh, arguably, backbenchers feel like they're um, spectators, and junior ministers feel like they're spectators to the cabinet, yeah. and cabinet ministers feel like they're spectators to number ten. And it's like, actually, it turns out that all of this is about coalition building. I don't know. Did you read? Did you read Paul War's piece? Mm. And did that resonate with you? So, uh, I mean, there was a bit about the actor, not a spectator. Yeah, in that. yeah, yeah. For, for good and bad reasons, it, it resonated. Um, I, I, I think um, I, I absolutely uh, sympathise with the. D desire to be on the pitch or in the ring or what, whatever you want, want to call it. Um, I think at the same time, the amount of time the politician spends asking themselves what the media says, uh, you're constantly wondering who has the greater power. Okay, but you, do, you, do you feel like, I mean, have you felt like you were on the pitch or has it felt like being a bystander in Parliament? Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I think um, it, it is wrong to say that uh, backbenchers of either party are simply spectators. It's obviously wrong to say that ministers are simply spectators. You have a different platform and a different opportunity to use mm. it. Um, 
obviously ministers to some extent are making executive decisions, but they're not making them in a vacuum. Um, backbenchers have a platform to uh, nudge or even literally change those decisions. So, so I think it's about learning how to do the things you can do from the place that you're in. And if you, uh, if, if you sort of set your sights on one position or one mm. whatever, then you're only going to drive yourself mad. You've got, to use the, you've got to use the tools that you've got to the best of your abilities. And just because you mentioned the media, I mean, are you concerned by the changes in the media landscape? I mean, there's been a lot of arguments about GB News, about the sight of, you know, Conservative MPs interviewing Conservative ministers. Mm. Uh, so I, th I think there's some bits where Ofcom has got some catching up to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there are, because they face a, which is not a criticism of them, they, 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 we face a different set of circumstances where regulators haven't had to, to work out what, what that means. Um, come an election, then once you become a candidate, then uh, you won't be able, those sorts of things won't, won't be permitted anyway. And I think we need to ask ourselves what, uh, what that should look like in peacetime, so to speak. Mm. Uh, what I, what I, guess I mean, in the interest I, of balance, I should add that, you know, we're going to have Labour peer Aisha Hazarika interviewing Labour ministers quite possibly as mm. well, so it's not limited yeah, to... Yeah, ex ex exactly. Um, I should have thought of that myself. Um, there but, we go. That's for um, free. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but, but to be fair, like, it's never been a secret of where... I'm sure she wouldn't mind me saying this. It's never, it's never been a secret where mm. Aisha's politics were before she was, was put into the House of Lords. Um, but it's different being a legislator. It, 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 it is... But um, if, if you're interested in balance, mm. then you're interested in balance. And, and obviously, sort of that's tipped it even further in one direction. But it, it hasn't fundamentally changed the, the dynamic, I don't think. Um, I, I have mixed feelings about the increasing. So if you look at something like LBC, much more of the sort of James O'Brien, a, a very, very left wing commentator. Um, you look at some of the people on GB News or on, on, on the other end of the spectrum. Um, I broadly think that uh, most of this stuff is talking to strands of thought that are already out there. Um, and if we pretended that this stuff didn't exist and we tried to put the genie back in the bottle, then we would only be storing up greater pressure for later. Um, so so I, th I think we've got to tread carefully, but we shouldn't pretend that there is no one in Britain that thinks that GB News is a brilliant idea, and lots of it I think is a brilliant idea. Um, so, and, and, and I might not think the same about some bits of LBC, but like, yeah. vice versa. Like, the, the, the plurality is a huge strength, and the broad church of the media is just as much a strength as the broad church of political parties. Excellent. Well, we've run out of time, but not quite, because we have the best bit now, which is our quick-fire round, oh, no. on which you are going to be judged by your colleagues. So, Good. it's a series of quick-fire, one-word answers. The answer is always both. Okay, here we go. BBC or Netflix? BBC. Guardian or GB News? Ooh. <laughs> Can I say both or neither? Say phone a friend. <laughs> <laughs> USA or EU? What for? Well, generally. Just what? <laughs> um, I, I'm not very good at quick fire rounds, am I? Well, that's um, all right. I, there have been people being a lot worse than you, I have to say. Yeah, no, um, I think you, you have to have both. I'm not going to choose. Okay. Prince Harry or Piers Morgan? <laughs> what for? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I dread to think. <laughs> yeah, e e exactly. I think you're overthinking yeah, this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I think Piers Morgan is a better journalist. Okay. Greg's or Pret? Uh, Greg's. Hotel or Airbnb? Airbnb. Tofu or sausages? Sausages. Levelling up or cutting taxes? Levelling. Don't say there's no tension between the two. I mean... There's, there's no tension between okay, the two, no. but I fancy levelling up if okay. I have to choose. All right, OK. Bike or car? Mm, car. EV or SUV? EV. Beer or wine? Yes. Science, <laughs> sciences or humanities? Uh, I, I did an English degree. I think I have to say humanities. OK, fair enough. Football or rugby? Rugby. Oh, dear. Twitter <laughs> or TikTok? Twitter, if I have to. Cash or contactless? Contactless. LTNs, yes or no? Yeah, all right. Uh, depends, imp depends if you think they're some sort of globalist conspiracy. <laughs> oh, you'll do. <laughs> Imperial or metric? Metric. I'm not Su that old. OK. And finally, Sunak or Cameron? Both. Oh, Lord. Matt Woolman, thank, thank you very, you very, very much, much indeed. You can clap now. <laughs> that was a pregnant pause, wasn't it? <laughs> that was superb. There's more wine at the back if you want one. And you, you'd be hanging, you can I check. Will, I think, yeah. Yeah.